Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. Now, Sharesies is a wealth development platform whose purpose is to create financial empowerment for everyone. My name is Frances Cook. I am the investments editor for Business Desk, and we have a special offer for Sharesies investors from Business Desk. If you use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH100, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST. The offer only applies to new Business Desk subscribers, can only be used once per subscriber, and can't be used with any other discounts. And before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Also, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our guests today, you can submit them through the Ask a Question button down below. Don't leave questions in the discussion area. They could get missed, but please do chuck them into the Ask a Question section. We love them. Please do be kind and respectful towards our guest and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we will unfortunately have to take steps to remove you from the webinar. Now, today we're joined by Andrew Peskett. He's the CEO of Radius Care. Radius operates in the aged care and retirement village sectors. The company has 22 aged care facilities, two retirement villages, and employs over 15,000 people. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, Francis. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today and um, looking forward to the discussion. Oh, really looking forward to it. I think it's a fascinating business. So tell me about Radius Care. What's your core business? Yeah, look, our core business is caring for uh, older New Zealanders, and we run a model where we have high acuity care throughout the company. And we've got, as you say, 23 care homes with a focus on the high acuity care, which is a point of difference from our competitors. And, um, we, you know, we've got an amazingly empowered staff that bring exceptional care to, to those residents. Yeah. So what makes Radius different from others in the aged care sector? Sure. Look, the Radius is a is care centered. And I think the, the other listed players in particular uh, have a full continuum of care, including retirement village units, development units and service departments, whereas we focus on care and we have a very, very um, engaged and empowered workforce of 1,700 people who look after the residents in our care homes. And uh, the, to date, we have been very care related and care focused, which is a slight point of difference uh, to our competitors who have the fuller continuum um, of care. And, and the high acuity relates to all, all levels, so rest home, hospital, and in some cases, dementia and psychogeriatric care. So, so the, that's the, the key point of difference for our company. Interesting. Why focus on those sectors? Yeah, sure. Look, look the way the business has developed is we've acquired care homes and uh, decided through, you know, the last 15, 25 years that um, developing the care and having a, a focus on care means that we're not distracted by um, other elements. And I think we'll, you know, potentially hit on later what the strategy is moving forward. But it has meant that we we have an in incredibly engaged group of people that um, who are amazing towards towards the residents and do, in some cases, quite tough jobs, but do it amazingly well. Yeah, I mean, it is a very tricky sector. I mean, you're dealing with people who are often in a very vulnerable stage of their life. That's obviously a huge part of it. Um, and you're quite new in the CEO seat as well. Um, February this year, before that, you were with MetLife Care, one of our largest retirement village providers. So what attracts you to the sector, which, as you say, lots of moving parts can be complicated, important to get it right? Yeah, look, it's an it's an amazing sector. I've been part of the sector for nearly fifteen years now, and um, I think the experiences I had at MetLife Care uh, stand me in good stead for this role. And um, the the people are, are what attracted me to the sector. And this morning, on on my way to work, I was at Waipuna, 
uh, rest home and talking to the staff and visiting the residents and, and over breakfast. And it's pretty amazing to see that the care that goes into our older New Zealanders, um, our parents, our grandparents, and um, that is in immensely satisfying and rewarding. And um, moving forward as Omicron wanes, you know, that's where I want to spend a lot of my time is in the care homes and connecting with, with our amazing people. Yeah, yeah. I, as you say, Omicron, really big factor for a lot of businesses, but I imagine also you working in the aged care sector, that surely has to have a big impact too. What has the impact been like for your business? Look, I think like a lot of the sector, it's been really tough and our people have coped with it amazingly well. The um, We have had lockdowns of parts of our care homes and we've had lots of staff who have had to isolate either with COVID or with family members who have had COVID. So that's given us challenges. My, I've been super impressed with how uh, the staff have coped and how they've looked after each other and most importantly looked after our residents. And, and there have been extra costs that have been well documented across the sector. But um, as Omicron does start to wane, um, yeah, I've got nothing but amazing admiration for our team and, as I said, across the sector for, for everybody that has, has coped with Omicron to date. Yeah, I mean, keeping everyone safe, super important. What plans do you have to put into place on that? And also, how long do you expect those plans will be needed? Yeah, it's on a, a bit of a rolling basis. I think South Island is the focus now. And, and will be for the next few weeks, likely. Uh, who knows where the, the sub-variants may emerge from. So we, we will always have plans in place um, and our pandemic planning is probably as good as it's ever been now, uh, given the last couple of years. But we're hopeful that once the South Island normalizes slightly, certainly the North Island, our care homes are, are a lot more uh, well-staffed and less residents having Omicron now, fewer residents. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the South Island still Christchurch, you know, there's, there's still quite a few cases in all the care homes in Christchurch, but they're being incredibly well managed and, and hopefully we'll continue this into the future. Yeah, when you look at the sort of future proofing plans, what are you thinking months or a year, a couple of years? How long are you looking? Great question. I'll get my crystal ball. I, I, I would, uh, I, the, way we, the way we view it is the next few months should see the end of this material Omicron variant and uh, depending on the subvariants beyond that we'll have little bumps over the next period of six to 12 months potentially but yeah we, we will be prepared and um, and as needed react. Yeah really it's it's tricky isn't it to try and look ahead in the midst of a pandemic when you just don't know what the virus is going to do what that will force other businesses or the government to do there is a certain amount of just rolling with it isn't there yeah there is and we we talked before this interview about um the the good traits of a ceo and, and thankfully i'm blessed with a fair bit of optimism and that helps i think um for the organization to be um to be leading through these but you've summarized it perfectly yeah let's go back to that ceo role because you mentioned omicron and i got interested and distracted um but you are of course new coming in from MetLife Care, why make the change to Radius and were there any particular changes you wanted to bring about for the company? Sure, so Radius has always had an amazing reputation and I've kind of kept in touch with Brian through the years and it was just fortunate that when I ended with Met there was the, this opportunity and I came into Radius end of last year on a special projects role that then morphed in February to the CEO role. And, um, you know, I've loved it, having had the experience of acting CEO at MedLife Care. In terms of changes, uh, you know, I think the leadership team, we've made a few, a, a couple of appointments with a new CFO starting in July. That will be critical to the next five to six years uh, to, to help drive the business. In terms of strategy execution, I think we, the strategy is very clear, but we need to execute that quickly and well. And we've started with the UCG transaction, which subject to shareholder approval will settle on the 6th of May. And uh, happy to talk more about that in the future. But um, also the, another focus will be making sure that our care home leaders and everybody in our care home has everything they need to be to be their, their very best and lead in a decentralized way so that the key decisions 
are being made not in the support office but in in our care homes by our, our excellent leaders those are a few things that we're focusing on yeah talk me through as much as you can about that transaction give us a few more details sure so we historically have owned not many of our care homes we've leased uh, and that's been the the ownership model and part of our strategy is to buy as many freehold titles from our landlords as we can and to date we have or with with the ucg transaction we will have 12 out of 23 so the majority of our sites we will own and um, that's great because it gives us the optionality to develop um, up to 100 units over those four sites and it gives us more um, opportunity to premium charge and have care suites with occupation right agreements over them uh, which is kind of in the business optimization basket and just making sure we're performing um, to to ultimately reward shareholders yeah it's an interesting one that because um property obviously a, a huge capital asset so how do you make those decisions on obviously previously a lot of leasing now you're working on buying up how do you decide which ones to buy which ones to continue leasing how fast to go it's it's a really big expensive decision to make yeah look with rentals and cpi increases coming up with you know you mentioned inflation beforehand uh long term we want to own as many as possible and we want to buy those uh that we can as quickly as possible and the, and in terms of your question the development potential at each of those units sorry at each of those sites um is an important consideration because that's again going to be value accretive to shareholders to to develop those sites out and uh obviously if we can negotiate with landlords we are and will and we just want to make sure that we can buy as many as possible um, obviously bearing in mind capital constraints and and adequate capital raising so um, you know once we've settled in may we that won't be it we'll be looking to to complete that schedule of work as soon as we possibly can Mm. I mean, from an investor point of view, I've sometimes heard the slightly cheeky comment that when you invest in an aged care company, you're more investing in property assets that those sorts of companies hold rather than the business of aged care itself. What do you think of that sort of perspective? Yeah, well, if you look at the <clears throat> across the sector, you look at the Somerset share price and how they have traded on a premium to their NTA, that's certainly the case. They've mm -hmm bought I think at one stage 10 greenfield sites in a year and were, were very much rewarded by their um, share price uplift on that and the investment property revaluations that come from the properties totally so th that is correct across some of the sector players I think it's very important to remember that the the core care and and the quality of core care is what ultimately drives uh, resident and family satisfaction. So I don't want to be too distracted with the property aspects. I think the property aspects are important, but um, remembering that our focus is the leadership and the people and, and care. Yeah, and you mentioned before the capital raise. I think a lot of people are now paying more attention to capital raisings after that really high profile Air New Zealand capital raise. We also had New Zealand King Salmon. Suddenly people are really looking at these and quite interested. So what was the process involved in your capital raise? Oh, so we haven't done the capital raise yet. Just just to explain, the transaction will happen on the 6th of May, and then we have five months from the 6th of May to raise capital, and we did that to give us optionality and two very high profile examples you talked about uh, and listening to Phil Ashcroft's shared lunch last week. Uh, it's so important to get that right, to look after all shareholders and to not have shareholders diluted or disadvantaged by dilution or by, by big discounts, and we wanna get that right. Um, learning lessons potentially from other capital raisers and, and looking after all of our shareholders. So we've got quite a few different options that we're assessing at the moment of, of capital and um, we'll make sure we do that in a very fair way that looks after all shareholders and not just large shareholders. Yeah, and it's I, there's obviously only so much you can say ahead of time. Um, from what you can say, what sort of things are you weighing up? 
Yeah, look, I think that the, the looking after all shareholders is, is critical. We talk to the Shareholders Association as well and keep them in the loop. And, you know, it's great to have the association with sharesies and respect all shareholders because every, everybody's share is as valuable as somebody else's. So we just want to raise money in a way that looks after everybody, doesn't dilute and, and not too deep a discount to our uh, trade price. Mm. Do you think then there is a possibility of more than one capital raise? If you're looking at sort of a program of buying up properties, could there be more in the future? Yes, look, we, we don't want to overload bank debt, obviously. And I, and I think uh, we need to be careful about when we phase the acquisitions. And um, whilst I'm super keen and eager to get into strategy execution, we need to do it in a careful, considered way and, um, and looking at capital raise options at, at all times. Yeah, one of the things that strikes me as well, you know, with thinking about all of these sites you've got, I mean, you've got a big population bulge headed your way. The baby boomers are getting older, more and more of them will be thinking about care options. How does that impact your plans, both in terms of the property point of view and the care point of view? How do you work that all into the mix? Yeah. The, the, I think the demographics in the next 20 to 30 years are excellent and that's well known. We just need to, again, make sure that we, our, our standard of care is first class and, and um, you know, without parallel and our people are engaged in, in delivering the best care. And, um, you know, the, the strategy execution parts around brownfield, greenfield and um, buying leaseholds, you know, will help us to develop other facilities and give us a wider continuum of care, which will ultimately, you know, return value to shareholders. But but all the while focusing on our people, I think, is, is critical without wanting to sound repetitive. No, that makes sense, right? I mean, it is a business that has a lot of financial realities, but it is also very much a person to person business, isn't it? Yeah, look, walking the floors this morning, and, and as I do, and hopefully will do very often, it sure is, and it's that individual connection with every single worker there and every single resident there and their family, and um, it is a people business. The the bricks and mortar are kind of interesting and and um, need to be maintained, obviously, and, and looked after, but yeah, it is absolutely a people business, and um, anything I can do from in my role to, to help the people is, is you know, absolute of paramount importance. What sort of things do you keep an eye on in terms of that staff relationship, customer relationship? Are there things that you keep in mind as a red flag or a really good sign? What are your key indicators? Yeah, look, I think turnover of staff is important. If, if turnover is too high, there's usually a reason and it's usually related to leadership. I think leadership in itself is massively important and making sure our leaders, uh, you know, our leaders from support office are well connected with the care homes and just the, the general commitment and um, which is amazing from our people and therefore from our perspective, how do we reward and recognize that and do it in a way that is meaningful to each of the staff member. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, in terms of that as well, there has been a lot of talk about a shortage in nurses in general, as well as issues with whether nurses are paid enough. Um, is it a struggle getting staff? And do you think Radius will be amongst those who need to increase how much they pay? Sure. So first part of the question, it has been a struggle and our people team have done an amazing job over the last month or two in sourcing from all different parts of the globe, including Marshall Islands, UAE, Philippines, South Africa, some amazingly well-qualified RNs that, that are going to be starting and have started at our care homes. So we're, we're doing a good job of sourcing, but we're continuing to push because there is the shortage and, and New Zealand registered nurses or RNs are in very short supply. And I think the pay is something we do need to be very careful about. And uh, the only comment that I would make is that it's it's beyond just pay. I think if you look at remuneration and pay as a blunt object, it's pro probably not the only answer. 
you need to uh, reward and recognise them by way of training and um, other forms of recognition and, and development, career development, leadership development as well, because that is also what is really important to, to our RNs and, and getting them through the levels so that they can perform at a higher level and therefore be on higher levels of pay as well. So it's, it's, it's beyond pay, but, but it's an important issue. Yeah, I mean, it's often quite physical, challenging work as well, isn't it, right? And it, it's one that, as you say, you know, New Zealand nurses have been in short supply. It's often boosted by immigrant labour. So as the borders are opening up, is that something that is going to help? Um, do you have to have other strategies in place to overcome this? Um, what is that looking like for you? Yeah, I think we need to continue to be very flexible. Our team have some amazing sourcing options and uh, as as I was saying about the, the various different countries and, and supply channels, I think we need to be ahead of the game because everybody is starting to tap into those markets. So, um, but again, it, there it is, a, it's a very good sector for collegiality and we have groups that meet together to talk these things through. And uh, we, we're always happy to share because I think that's a strength of the sector is how collegial we are and we work to solve problems together, which is, which is, I think, a good thing. Yeah, do you think, what sort of lag are you expecting as the borders open up? What sort of lag are you expecting in terms of filling some of those gaps and will it be enough? There is a lag because you have to get people into the country and then get them uh, without going into, into too technical a term, cap train, so ready to practice in New Zealand. Uh, I, I guess I don't know the exact time frame, but as soon as possible, if we can get them in and get them cap trained, but but there's certainly a month or two lag before they can then practice, and um, so it's not an immediate fix. And my view is, if the more uh, funnels that we have, and the more funnels that we have open uh, and use, uh, the better into the future, because I don't see a short term fix. Yeah, in your half year results. Um higher wage costs and higher cost of business in general really pulled your profits down. Um, and of course, you've already mentioned that in terms of the inflation figure that's come out today and the staffing costs and things like that. So where do you see that going in the future? Look, absolutely, we we need to be careful and um, be, be very aware. I, I mean, I guess it's controlling the controllables. We don't have control over inflation. so. If I think about our strategies around optimization of existing business and how we can um, premium charge it, it across the organization and across facilities more, uh, how we can introduce, as I was saying before, auras into care suites and um, increase occupancy and mix. I think those are all key revenue levers to offset the cost levers um, whilst doing what we can on a cost basis, uh, but, but at the same time retaining staff. Quite a juggle, but um, good opportunities. Yeah, is there anything you'd like to see happening in the wider New Zealand economy that would help your business? Uh, look, I think that, that not not so much wider New Zealand economy, but in terms of the the funding of the aged care, this is not an interview about aged care funding, but I, I do think that is an area that um, certainly the, the sector is underfunded and um, I, I know work's being done to, to rectify that and that's certainly something that I would really, really like to see and, and will help to support the Aged Care Association and their, um, their issues there. Interesting. Okay. Now, we're coming towards the end of the questions that I have, but I would just remind our viewers that really want to see your questions. There's some great questions in there already. So, chuck your questions into the ask a question section and also upvote those that you want to see us ask and answer so then we know which ones to priority. Now, does um, New Zealand have unique factors to consider in aged care? Yeah, I, I guess so. It's a good question. I think New Zealand it has a very, very amazingly advanced aged care and retirement village sector in terms of the legislation and the effort that's gone into it, if you compare to, to overseas countries. I think uh, that's great. That's that's a big tick for the sector. I, I think because we're isolated and uh, with the RN shortage, that makes it more difficult 
and to get, for instance, RNs into the country and then into accommodation. So it's a, a bit of a balance in relation to, to the country and the pros and cons of, of New Zealand. But overall, and coming back to your point earlier around sec the sector and the, the um, tailwinds of the next 20 to 30 year demographics, it's, you know, it's a great sector to be in, in New Zealand. Are there any policy changes you'd like to see the government make? Not such policy changes. I think the framework is good. You know, we we have a recently appointed aged care commissioner who um, I know and is excellent. Um, I think the regulations are fair and um, quite comprehensive. I think it, it comes back to funding. Mm. Okay. So over the next 12 months-ish, what would be your big highlight that you're hoping to see and are there any low lights that you're keeping an eye on sure so so i think the key thing in the next 12 months is is the people so bedding in our leadership team who i talked about uh and making sure they are close to the business i think is critical getting to care homes on a very regular basis will be will be massively important for me and for our team and then just just driving that culture so that we can then execute strategy and um, deliver the best care to our residents. That's Those are kind of my key areas of focus and all people related. Challenges, the headwinds, obviously, uh, we did talk about costs and uh, RE and availability. We, we again, just need to, to deliver really, really good and um, compelling programs for our, for our people and um, a good reward and recognition um, system and um, remuneration so that they're fairly paid and and well rewarded for their amazing job because I think you talked about earlier they do do an amazing job and every time I visit I'm you know overwhelmed uh, it's quite emotional it's probably not the sort of job a, a lot of the work that's done in care homes that I'd be frankly very good at and um, that is quite humbling to see the, the amazing jobs that our our people do and the care for our elder New Zealanders. Yeah, certainly quite a challenging area for people to work when they're on the front lines of that. I'd agree with you on that. Um, there are some great questions coming into the Q&A section, so I'm going to jump to that. We're going to start with um, a toughie from Jane. I love this. Um, since Radius listed on the stock market, the shares dropped drastically. Since then, there has been little or no movement other than down. Gains seem to be few and far between. In your opinion, why is this when the aged care sector is doing so well? Yeah, it is a good question. So currently at around 40 cents, having listed at 82 cents, um, it's it, the, a couple of reasons from my perspective. I think the sector actually in the last six months has been punished quite badly. Uh, across, if you look at Ryman, are currently trading at just under nine dollars having been traded at 15 16 dollars not long ago and across the sector everybody even somerset is down so there is a bit of sector bias and because of some of the headwinds we've talked about um, we discounted our uh, capital raise last year from the ex existing share price was a 32 percent discount and i'm not sure that that helped the longer term share price but i think the key thing is moving forward at 40 cents what do we do over the next two three five years to provide value to shareholders and and around empowering our people executing our strategy and um making sure that everybody is fully focused the new leadership team um the, the members that are coming in how they're focused on the strategy and delivering and um, so it's kind of a short term thing that I don't look at every day or every week. And I know we can deliver the, the strategy to then to bring the long term value to so that, um, yeah, more long term confidence. Yeah. What would be the key thing in that strategy, do you think? Key, key thing is just to deliver the, the cost optimization through um, premium charging through more care beds, uh, online shop revenue, uh, acquiring more of the freehold sites from our landlords, delivering on the brownfield projects we've talked about, like 100 UCG properties, up to 100 UCG properties, buying more greenfield land and having more RV units. Uh, if you say it quickly, it doesn't sound like much, but there's quite a bit of work under each of those strategic work streams, and um, we're all super excited about it. 
Yeah, there's a great question here from Alice as well. I, I think we have touched on this, but let's dive into it in a bit more depth. Why has the leasing model traditionally been used over direct ownership? And why are you now focusing more on the ownership model? Yeah, look, I, I don't really want to talk too much about why it was in place. It is in place and um, it was set up as a very successful business and Radius Care has always been successful with the leasehold model. It's just moving into a higher uh, inflation and um, rent um, mode now. The um, owning the properties just gives us the development flexibility, means that we can develop more units in a different configuration for different types of charges and optimize the sites uh, without having to obtain landlord's consent, etc. And obviously reduces um, annual costs and, and uplift, uh, there's resulting uplifts to EBITDA and profitability per site. Yeah, well, with the inflation figures out today, one of the big things was the housing property construction sector. Um, so, you know, anyone who is listening to this who's a renter probably is well aware that rents have been going up. So that's also been hitting businesses, has it? Well, yeah, our, our rents are in most cases CPI adjusted. So moving forward, the more CPI adjusted rentals we have in the next, you know, one to three years, um, we need to, you know, we'd rather be owning those properties than renting them, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and another one, well, on that topic, actually, let's grab onto this one also from Alice. Inflation is a hot topic with the latest figures released just this morning. Is Radius feeling these cost pressures? How will you manage these? Great questions, Alice, by the way. Yeah, look, I think, again, it comes down to how much we want to keep up with the, there is a, a, a you know some some listed operators um, are tackling the registered nurses issue by blanket salary increases and very very large salary increases and uh, you have to be careful about relativity of other staff. I think you know paying registered nurses fair wages and um, increasing their other benefits are important. So yeah, we need to be very aware of cost of living generally for all of our staff and uh, make sure we pay them properly. Mm. This one from Susanna is a great one. Um, how do you think about communicating with your retail shareholders versus your institutional shareholders? And what is the value that the retail shareholders, such as those on sharesies, bring versus the institutional? So yeah, great question. So I think it's important to communicate with all shareholders and that's one of my key jobs on day one. I rang around um, all key contacts um, from Sharesies to NZSA. I think it's critical that all shareholders are communicated with and via whatever forum. This is a great forum. Um, Sharesies are really, really open to different forms of communication and have been great in my few months. Uh, as I said a couple of times, the Shareholders Association is a great organisation and gives us great reach to our retail shareholders. But by the same token, I'm happy also to meet one-on-one -on -one with shareholders, um, attend Shareholders Association conferences and just talk and be available. I think that's a critical thing is to be available and um, to know that all shareholders are important uh, and not just bigger shareholders. Yeah, when it comes to things like the capital raise, which obviously can sometimes get a bit complicated, um, and for some retail investors, maybe it'll be their first involvement in such a thing. Um, how do you keep those lines of communication open in those sorts of situations? I think we have to be proactive and contact the, the key people who have an outreach to retail shareholders. Obviously, we can't contact all retail shareholders, but it's being available to take calls as needed and, and letting them know that we can, we are available, and also to, yeah, to be have open discourse and discussion with sharesies and um, the Shareholders Association and, and key contacts. Yeah, so is it things like, you know, if, if someone emails you, are they going to get a reply back from you? I imagine you're fairly busy. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe not within five minutes, but I think it's critical. And, and again, I get lots of emails from individual staff members as well. Um, and I will always respond and respond very respectfully because I think it's really, really important that, that I'm available. And being busy is kind of a bit of a cop out, to be honest. Absolutely. Mm. I, I challenge people online to, to test me on that in a good way. And um, 
hopefully you get a nice respectful response that um, that works for you all. I love that. All right. Well, we've got um, this one's getting quite a few upvotes, so we have to go for it. This is from Laura. Hi, Andrew. Could you explain how your residents pay for their care or their retirement village units? Sure. So the the main way they pay is through a daily or weekly charge, which is in some cases subsidised by the government. Then um, they can pay, as we mentioned a couple of times, premium charges on top of that if the room has a nice view or an ensuite um, and is or is slightly larger. So that's your daily or weekly rate. And then for retirement village units or care suites with what I was describing before as occupation right agreements or auras, they pay a capital sum up front, let's say $300,000. And um, in the typical model at Radius and other listed operators, they will uh, at the end of three years have 30% of that. Um, so baby maths, 210 will be returned. So 90,000 90, will be deducted as a what we call deferred management fee. So hopefully that's not too technical, but there are two, two in summary, two ways, either a uh, care home standard daily or weekly charge or via an aura uh, capital sum payment. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yeah, well, hopefully it makes sense to, to the Laura. listeners as well. Yeah, to Laura. If it doesn't, drop another question in the Ask a Question team. There's still plenty of time. Um, in the meantime, we will jump to this one from Colin because I think this is an interesting thought. How do you identify locations to set up a new facility? Is it important to set up in the correct location or is it more build it and they will come? Yeah, another excellent question. Thank you, Colin. It, it's more you you target the location and you target where, um, in particular, from a retirement village perspective, we've got some pretty technical people that have uh, what we call net latent demand in the area. So, who is able, to, you know, that the, the um, population age around the area, and then how many are already in villages or not, or how many are at home, and so that gives us a net latent demand number. And um, put simply, that's a, a rating out of 10. And nine is a, we should definitely buy that piece of land all the time for the right price. Um, a five or below is walk away. And so we do quite a bit of work in that space. And um, that's quite an exciting um, area for, for the growth is to buy the right areas because the buy and you will come is um, not really, uh, yeah, it doesn't really work. I think you need to, to be quite targeted around the, the demand and um, also things like amenities and facilities and services in that particular area. That's really interesting. So it's quite a technical assessment you put into it. I mean, you mentioned a few things there, but tell us a bit more about what goes into that assessment of how it gets that number ranking. Yeah, so there'll be a demand and supply and how many people of a set age live in that area, for example, how many are already in care homes slash villages or their own house and then so how many are available to 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 move and um you know for instance how many other operators are there in the region and therefore how many or, and also how many operators have resource consents for that region to then build care homes and retirement villages mm -hmm. so those are the pretty key inputs right down to um gender and ethnicity of the people so it's quite granular information that that we have um at our hands to, to assess new sites because particularly in this market, lots and lots of sites get through um, or, or get sent to us every day or every week to our property team. And um, we kind of need to assess them from a best site perspective rather than being reactive. And that's certainly um, what the team does here. Fascinating stuff. Um, okay, this is a great question. I'm not sure if it was submitted anonymously or if the name was just let off. But um, the question says, how will you grow from here? The stock price means raising equity could be quite dilutive and rising costs of debt makes it tricky to find positive NPV deals. On that note, can you outline the debt maturities and impact of rising interest rates? So a few parts wow. to that. <laughs> I, feel like I'm Dive in. I feel like I'm suddenly on an investor call. I've been morphed into an investor call. Um, 
Well, look, I think it's a, it is an excellent question. I think the key is any capital raise that we embark upon post a transaction like UCG or when we're anticipating a transaction is making sure we have source of capital that will not be uh, dilutive and or at a discount. I think that's the key part of the first part of the question. Sorry, Francis, I missed the second part of the question. It's a bit no, of that's all right. Um, rising costs of debt make it tricky to find yep. positive NPV deals. And is there an impact of debt maturities and rising interest rates? Yes, y yes and yes. I, I think we need to be careful that we don't overload debt. I think there, there are through, throughout the sector, um, certain entities have been, if you like, punished by the market for having too high a debt in the last five years. And that's something we need to guard against from in terms of bank debt. And so raising capital at appropriate prices and through appropriate channels is absolutely critical to that. So really, really good quite technical questions, but hopefully that's enough to um, to go on. Yes, I'm always impressed by the standard of questions we get through here. It's fantastic. Um, another one here from Diane, and this may have to be our last question. We'll see how we go on time. Um, but with the high cost of registered nurses, have you and others in the sector looked at training people at a lower level, i.e. maybe certificate level, to do lower level jobs with a registered nurse supervising. Is that possible? Diane, you're right on the money. We have healthcare assistants that do exactly that and um, they are being utilised at the moment in that space and doing a really great job. I think the job done by healthcare assistants generally or HCAs as they're known in the industry is amazing and potentially has been underestimated. We're thinking about even hosting um, a conference for them to encourage their learning and development and the more we can do of that the better. So right on the money Diane if that is the last question it's it's an excellent one. And we will just squeeze in this very, very last one. Um, yesterday we heard Ramsey Healthcare, a big player in Australia, is considering a takeover offer by private equity entity. Is private equity something you would consider in the future? Well, I didn't know that. That's good to know. I'd be interested to know who that was. Um, we, I mean, I have quite a bit of experience with private equity through a former life at Met uh, who was taken over by uh, Swedish-based private equity EQT and um, you know they run a, a great model and um, they are showing a lot of interest in Australia um, they yeah that they run um, aged care companies I think they EQT bought Stockland relatively recently and so you know any Australian private equity or global private equity that's interested um, sometimes as was the case with Met, that was beyond our hands and, and um, you have to be relatively reactive to a scheme or a takeover. Um, but um, yeah, who knows? They're, they're quite acquisitive and doing a great job, um, I think, in, in improving um, the ownership model and standard and certainly in Australia at the stage. So really interesting. I must look that up after the session. Yes. Uh, yeah. As we were saying, our listeners are all over these things, um, keeping an eye on the market. So thank you for tuning in, everyone. And a big thank you as well to you, Andrew, for joining us. Really appreciate your time and insights. Thanks, Francis. I've really enjoyed it and hopefully answered all your questions and the listeners' questions. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to Business Desk and to Sharesies. And um, looking forward to seeing some future series here. And um, I've really enjoyed the time. Oh, it's been a great chat. Um, now, for everyone who's interested in more information, please do also check out Sharesy's financial news podcast, Recap. It's about 10 minutes long, published four times a week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Now, next week on Shared Lunch, my colleague Dan Brunskill will be in the hot seat talking with Dr. Masa Mohagek. The good doctor is a computer engineer and will guide you and Dan through the exciting world of artificial intelligence. There's a link to register for that in the chat right now. Enjoy the rest of your week. Do stay safe.
Thank you.